If you'll just keep on walking beyond what people expect of you, every step that you take beyond what people expect, you build tremendous loyalty. But it's also transforming for our life. We're now going to bring out a second extraordinary entrepreneur. And um, this entrepreneur grew up in the business a little bit like you did indirectly. I think at nine years old, he was exposed. And he is the chairman of a little company called Chick-fil-A. Dan Cathy, ladies and gentlemen, chairman of the board of Chick-fil-A. Whoa, yes, have a seat. So, Dan, I mean, your family and what you've built as a family, I think you're the third largest, is that right, fast food chain in, in the United States? Behind uh, McDonald's and Starbucks, but uh, we may eclipse Starbucks in the next 24 months. So stay wow, that's, what I have, that's amazing. <laughs> and your, your individual units, as I understand, actually produce almost 50% more than McDonald's does. It's more than that, but we won't mention that exact number. <laughs> But our, awesome. advantage, our advantage is that we're only operating six days a week. I know, I want to talk about that. Versus their seven days a week. So yeah. we think that's a tremendous competitive Tremendous advantage by giving up a day a week. I love it. So let's talk a little bit about the history. I mean, your father, too, is an extraordinary human being, obviously, lived in 93. He opened that first uh, location, the Dwarf. It was called the Dwarf. Dwarf Grill. Dwarf Grill. Why'd they it, call it the Dwarf Grill? It was like 1946 or 47? Well, it was a tiny little place, so he's called it a Dwarf Grill, you know. Okay. But uh, we were in South Atlanta. He bought this little property, but he bought the property with the idea of building a restaurant on it, he and his brother, but didn't know that you had to have it zoned for commercial use. Oh. So that's important when you're trying to get building permits. So he had to go back and kind of figure that out as he went along. But we had uh, 10 stools at the counter, had four tables with chairs, had a cigarette machine on one end and a jukebox machine on the other. So a jukebox machine is this thing that plays <laughs> records and so forth, <laughs> kind of like an MP3 player. <laughs> I have to explain that to people. That's awesome. But, but it was at this little family restaurant that um, my mother was a waitress there at the restaurant. It's a family business. I mean, it, talking about mom and pop, we, it was my pop and my mom that were you know, running this place. And uh, I saw my dad's you know, commitment to this little business and a commitment to customers. He was behind the counter flipping hamburgers and scrambling eggs. This is before Chick-fil-A came along in the early 60s. Yes. So tell us a little bit about the values that you learned and tell us a little about the invention yeah. of the chicken yeah. sandwich and how that changed to yeah. Chick-fil-A. Well, one great uh, value lesson, life lesson, is that from my mom and dad is that we don't have to be a victim mm -hmm. of the circumstances that we grew up in. Mm -hmm. My mom and dad came from very dysfunctional families. My, my mom's father abandoned her and her mother when she was just an infant. On my father's side, uh, he had to live through the Great Depression, 1928, 1930s, and he was sold real estate and insurance, and he was very, very discouraged because he couldn't provide for his family as the breadwinner of the family. And so they moved to the first federally funded housing project in the nation known as the Techwood Home Apartments. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather was very discouraged and very embittered in fact, my dad says he can never remember his father ever telling him that he loved him. Mm -hmm. and, and fortunately for my brother, my sister, that pendulum swung back the other way. Mm -hmm. and, and they decided as they were married, um, and married for uh, 68 years, that they were going to have um, a very different model. And I was the beneficiary of mm -hmm. some really godly mom and dad. I mean, it was a, it was a godly Christian That's beautiful. Home. Really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my dad always said the most important decisions that you make in life, and he taught Sunday school for 43 years to young teenage boys. He said the three most important decisions you like, start with the letter M, who your master in life is going to be, who your mate in life is going to be, and what your mission mm. in life is going to be. It's beautiful. Master, mate, and mission. You make those three decisions right, brother, you got the rest of it is going to be be made. So I was so fortunate to be taught that, but to also see it modeled out in the way in which dad operated that little family restaurant and the way they treated the staff. It's beautiful. Now, what was your second question? 
Second question was, uh, how the invention of Chick-fil-A came because he ah. created the first chicken sandwich, boneless yes. chicken sandwich. Yes. So how did that come about? We, we were a, a, a diner operation, short order, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 24 hours a day, six days a week. And so the chicken sandwich came along because he wanted to serve chicken. But when you serve chicken with bones in it, it takes a lot longer to cook. It really doesn't, it doesn't really fit in a food service, fast food, quick service restaurant environment. Um, but he remembered how his mother used to sometimes debone chicken breast and how she would season it. She operated a boarding house and she would season it on Saturday night to be served for lunch on Sunday. And when my dad in his, uh, is 25 years old, he operated that little restaurant for about 10 years before he started working on this little, little formulation. And um, he originally called it a chicken steak sandwich. We put it on our menu. The customers loved it. Uh, but realized you could not register the name chicken steak sandwich. You had to misspell it or do something different. Yeah. And so he, he, he had this idea. Why don't we call it chick fill a, uh, as in filet mignon, and deboned chicken breasts are oftentimes referred to as the filet mignon of chicken. Ah, oh, interesting. So chick fill and a was separated because it's it grade A, you know, the best quality. And we paid an artist $75 to design that little C with, with the beak. It's the best $75 in marketing we've ever done. That's awesome. I, 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 That's I awesome. wish the people in McCann... Uh, our agency in New York would send us $75 invoices, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's long awesome. ago. That's but awesome. we, began, we opened up our little family restaurant. It worked really well. Dad also began to license other mom-and-pop restaurants to serve the product in the early 60s. But uh, the real growth of our business really started in 1967 as we started opening up in shopping, shopping malls. Greenbrier Shopping Mall in 1960. They were like the, the shopping mall food courts, is that right? In the beginning? Well, there weren't even food courts at well, the they time. Weren't. In fact, there's very little food in the malls because the food was messy and on and on. But developers soon learned that if you don't provide for food service in a shopping mall, people are going to leave and they might not come back. Right. So uh, food was really kind of a, a secondary kind of thing in malls. But it became such a big part of, of the mall operation that they began to design food courts back in the 70s and 80s. And then it was about 18 years later, if I remember correctly, that you opened the first real restaurant, not in a mall, Yes, right? yeah, freestanding restaurant. Uh, the, the demalling of America was beginning to... to yes, you guys saw that yes. coming. Yeah. Yeah. What lessons did your father instill in terms of the customer? Um, I don't know if... It, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know if it was you or if I remember reading it, it was your father that when someone says, thank you, for example, you say, my pleasure. Yes. And, you know, what that whole focus of this level of a relationship, yeah. you both have that in common, like really creating a relationship with the customer. Yeah. What, tell me what some of the values are that he instills in you and the yeah. rest of the family one around the, how, how you serve people. One of the most uh, memorable experiences I had as a teenager uh, was going on the roof of our little dwarf house restaurant as my dad had to deal with uh, our night manager who was drinking beer and alcohol during the middle of the night and throwing his beer cans up on the roof of our restaurant. Mm -hmm. Now, you ask about customer service, but customer service in front of the counter is a reflection of how you're dealing with people behind the counter. Mm -hmm. If you want to improve external service quality, then you got to up your game on internal service With quality. Employees, yes. We walked up on the top of that roof, and my dad was heartbroken to see beer cans all over the top of that roof where Charlie Seelock, our nap manager, was heaving those cans up. I'd known Charlie all my life. He was like an uncle to me. And I just knew that's going to be it for Charlie Seelock. I mean, drinking on the job, I mean, if you had to come up with a reason to terminate somebody, he fully qualified for that. But as we were coming down the steps of that ladder, uh, to see my dad in the weeks to come to have conversations with Charlie Seelock. And rather than fire Charlie, uh, he helped him get into an Alcoholics Anonymous program. That's wonderful. And he had compassion. Mm -hmm. And he extended grace. Mm -hmm. And I, as I think about the attributes of leadership, because you, you, you asked the question was about customer service, but the genesis of all this, um, in my view, is that once we as individuals have experienced forgiveness in our own life, it becomes a lot easier yes. to extend grace toward other people. Yes. And say, if I can help this person get through this crisis in their life, 
uh, there's tremendous loyalty that can come from that. They'll never leave you. Once you've extended grace to somebody like that, but it's also the ripple of all the other folks that got, they knew Charlie was drinking on the job as well. They knew Dad had every reason to fire him. And so these kinds of the ways of dealing with people behind the counter with grace and kindness and consistency based on how I think our Heavenly Father has, has dealt with us and we, yes. we've experienced that personal yes. relationship begins to dramatically affect how other people are being treated. It, it ripples throughout the whole organization now. So we're, we're more known for our customer service based on some of those principles uh, we also did an extreme service makeover 20 years ago where we wanted to dramatically distinguish ourselves with our customers, and we built it on a scripture verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 41. Uh, Jesus said, if one of those stinky Roman soldiers asks you to carry something for one mile and you get to the one-mile marker, I want you to keep on walking, and if you'll just keep on walking beyond what people expect of you, every step that you take beyond what people expect you build tremendous loyalty. But it's also transforming for, the, for our life. To your own character, to your own view Because of he who refreshes others will yes. themselves be refreshed. So yes. I could go on and on about that. Yes. Let's stop. Well, I, have a, I wear these crazy little hats sometimes on the side of the hat. It says, be a blessing and underneath it says, and you will be blessed. Because I think that's really the formula to life. That's, yeah. Business to me is a spiritual game. It's how do I do more for others than anybody else yes. in the industry? And that's what every great religion, I'm yes. personally Christian as well, but every great religion has some theme like yes. love thy neighbor like thyself. Yeah. It's like it's the essence of what humanity needs. That's what our spirit needs. And so when you practice that in your business, your business grows. Yeah. How, you've got 130,000 employees, I think. Is that what I read? It's about twice that, actually. Oh, that, you're that are wearing this Chick-fil-A name tag. So we have, you, have two, you have a quarter yeah, of a million employees? Yeah, yes, but, but it's, it's a lot of teenagers. We print a lot of W-2s. You know, we have, um, we have a very high retention rate, however. We, our retention rate is 3x better than our competition. And because they stay with us, yes. we're able to teach them uh, civility and kindness and graciousness. I, I like to think, tell you, if any of the folks that are watching today, if you've got any you know, sons or daughters and you want us to teach them how to be respectful and say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and it's my pleasure, then you need to send them to Chick-fil-A. We're like a junior <laughs> cotillion you know, for food service. Because there's a, there's a lot of heathen, barbaric teenagers out there that need to hear. <laughs> heathen, barbarian pleasure. teenagers. Right. <laughs> but well, tell me, though. It's, it's so shocking to customers, though, to hear you know, a teenager be respectful. They've never seen that. And, it's, and attentive and connected. Oh, yeah, and yeah. It makes the food taste better. Ben Franklin said that handshake of the host affects the taste of the roast. Mm -hmm. and, and it works with chicken sandwiches, too. <laughs> well, with a quarter of a million employees, and you have, are there 2,700 locations or 3,000 now? You got some old, it's about 3,000 now. 3,000, okay, good. There was one just opened around the corner for me <laughs> this last week on Lantana down here. Yeah. And I, I couldn't believe how fast it was built, but then the very first day there were lines all around. So I wanna ask you two questions. First, tell me how you recruit those people because to have that kind of culture, yes, you gotta train it, but well, that's all that. I, I read that you guys work hard at making sure you get the right kind of person to come join you in the yeah, first place. I, I, and you have a very unique setup in terms of, let's take it one at a time. How do you recruit the people? And then secondly, you have a different philosophy. This is not something like McDonald's where people might buy five of them yeah. as an investment. You really work to select people and you still own the real estate. So tell me two things. First, how do you recruit? How do you train? How do you know somebody's right? Especially when you have an organization as big as it is, how have you leveraged that? What's the process? Or what are some of the thoughts or questions? And then two, tell us a bit how you're different in your setup of the leader of that organization as opposed to most, most of yeah. the franchises. Well, I think for all of us, as Peter Drucker said, it's not about the what, it's yes. all about the who. That's right. And when we can make good decisions about the who, that represents our values, that's an extension of our own personality, uh, whatever that may be, is so very important. When we select our restaurant operators, we typically think of, uh, what we call the three C's. We think about their competence, uh, their business acumen, their the competence and their character, uh, and the chemistry, uh, their, their passion, their enthusiasm. And in order to go through that process, we spend a lot of time with people. This past year, we had 100 and, 
127,000 people that made application to be on our corporate staff or to be a restaurant operator. And out of that, we selected about 110 to be restaurant operators and another 200 to be on our corporate staff. So you have to spend a lot of time with people to to get to know that. We can cut that down to about 7,000. Uh, and then it, it, the cost per interviewee and going through that. Um, so it, it's really hard to become a part of Chick-fil-A. Someone said that it's easier to get a job at the CIA than it is with CFA. <laughs> and uh, and we, we try to live up to that. And we, we check things. We check grade point averages and all these other kinds of things. You know, mm. we, even politicians are finding that it's important to be truthful on your resumes and so forth. And we do that. Gradually, kind of, they're learning that. <laughs> but we check that kind of thing. And if people are dishonest on simple things like grade point averages and that sort of thing, then there's a character issue there. And we'll just go into the next person because we Smart. don't want to bring that into the organization. You, you ask about the, um, what we call the operator rel- the relationship we have with our operators and as we think about um, what's our hedgehog, Jim Collins asks us, you know, what's the one thing you do better than anybody else? Yes. Well, we could say it's the chicken sandwich, but we know internally that it's the relationship we have our restaurant operators of entrepreneurship, um, being in business by themselves, but uh, for themselves, but not by themselves. Yes. And so our deal is the same today as it was when we opened our first mall location in 1967. So... Um, Dad would, would build the location, as we do today. We'll buy the land. Sometimes we do a ground lease. We'll build the location out, and then we'll sign an operating agreement for an individual to operate that location. And, of course, they have to operate it to our operating standards. Uh, they only, we only require a $10,000 um, uh, deposit, if you will. It's like a deposit on an apartment or something. If you leave Chick-fil-A after three years... That's completely refundable back to you. Well, that's all they need to start? $10,000. Now, we're the capital partner. I get it. So by the time we buy the land, build the building, we've got about, 4, 000, about $4 million uh, in that investment to begin with. But our average restaurant sales volume is $9.2 million annually in sales. Wow. Our average operator income is right at $600,000 a year. That's net to them. Wow. About 25% of our operators have a second location. So you do the math. Wow. And, and if you do that math, you'll understand why we have a 98% retention rate <laughs> yes. among our restaurant operators. Yeah, man, that's beautiful. That's yeah. really awesome. The, the, yeah. the, the only way you can leave is you can die or retire. That's the only way you're going to want to leave Chick-fil-A. <laughs> well, tell me the with the process that you developed. You know, innovation you know, Peter Drucker always said business is really two things, innovation and marketing, finding a better way to serve the customer and then marketing, getting them to want to do business with you. Your innovation in the way you process people, both emotionally, the connection that's created, so it's not some squeaky little box, but also the volume. Like, I, I drove by the one the other day. It's on my way here. It was closed today because it's Sunday, but literally there were like three lanes of cars wrapped around, but they were going through so fast. What did you innovate in that area that's allowed you to process? Because, by the way, if you don't know it, Chick-fil-A has been selected, what, eight years in a row as the most loved restaurant by Americans. It's pretty wild. Give me a hand for that. It's pretty extraordinary, right? But, but they also, you're delivering this fresh, good food, but you're also doing it at a speed and with a connection. So what did you reinvent in that area that made this possible? Yes. We do a lot of simulations. We do a lot of uh, testing. Uh, modeling and on and on. So we take a very engineering approach to how we do uh, innovation, both for our equipment, recipes, and other things that are going on. So the drive-through, this is a really good good example. When COVID hit, we were about uh, 60% dine-in, 40% going through the drive-through. Yes. Now, today, uh, we're approaching about 90% drive-through. Only 10% people have changed that much. Still, 10% business coming in, coming in that dining room. That dining room is a big footprint, you know. Yes. And we got a lot invested in that footprint. Yes. Um, but um, being able to do the digitization, and all businesses have to be very conscious of the curb appeal, which is primarily the website, all the digital interface that goes on. We've invested very heavily in that. 
thankfully, before we had to. And if there's anything I can encourage people that are listening to this program, uh, you've got to stay ahead of the curve. Yes. You've got to anticipate where things are headed. It's that Wayne Gritsky, antis- you know, anticipate where the fuck is headed. Yes. My favorite quote on that is, uh, comes from General Electric, comes from Jack Welch, the legendary CEO. And he said this, um, he said, when the rate of external change exceeds the rate of internal change, disaster is imminent. Right. Disaster is imminent. So in other words, we can, we can be changing the wallpaper and got new colors on this, that, and other. You know, we, we're making change, but when the rate of that change is not in, in consistent with how much the external change is going on, that little delta difference yep. played out over time yep. means that you're going to be the next Kodak. It means you're going to be the next Blackberry. It means you're going to be the next Sears department store. Yes. You've changed stuff, but you're oblivious to how Sam Walton was dramatically changing mass merchandising in the area of department stores and so yes. forth. And so we've had to really anticipate where things are going. I, 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 for me, I, I'm a champion of change. I'm a champion of innovation. I'm a champion personally trying to do new things. That's why I've got in training on my name tag. Oh, I didn't see that. I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still so training. Dan Cathy, 50 years of service in training. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Give me a hand for that. That's awesome. So, so I'm still in the classroom. I'm still a trainee. And uh, I find that if you're a trainee, generally people are more patient with you uh, when you're, when you're, <laughs> I thought that was going to work at home with my wife, Rhonda. She said, uh-uh, you don't get away with that, you know, here, here at home. One of, the, one of the conversations I had with Bernie Marcus, who's the co-founder of Home Depot. Yeah. So I'm standing at Home Depot with him, and he's telling me about all these, you know, displays he's got and so forth. He says, you know, I used to start my management meetings on Monday morning talking about all the mistakes I made the previous week. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was stunned by that. He said, I'd start my Monday meetings talking about all the mistakes I've made the previous week. And I never heard Jack Welch talk about that. A lot of other businesses talking about you know, how to be transparent about mistakes that you're making. But it's brilliant because we're all making mistakes. That's right. And if we can just all learn from our, you know, our mistakes and we get smarter over time, yes. we get a lot of value for those mistakes yes. if other people can profit from it. Yes. So I'm just a real proponent for us to be very transparent and very honest about mistakes and shortcomings that we've got in life, knowing that people know that we're really trying to get better. We want to learn. We have an insatiable appetite of curiosity. Yes. And in my view, curiosity is the most essential uh, principle. I just finished reading Michael Dell's new book. He's got a kind of a second book that he just read. I just finished it last weekend. And at the very end of it, I mean, the, I think it's the last sentence, last paragraph, he talks about how essential it is for leaders to have an insatiable sense of curiosity about things. It drives us to travel, to ask questions, to, to interview people, and to be on this quest, to be on a search. And, I, and businesses have to stay on that search, stay on that quest, and especially if you're a 76-year-old family business that's never had a year of sales less than the previous year. You start being on that quest. You quit that's pretty wild. Questions. Never had sales less than the previous year in 76 years. That's yeah. extraordinary. But you got to stay with it and, and, and keep it that way. So it's constant, never-ending improvement. And you don't manage from Atlanta. I, I've talked to several people. They say, this guy lives on the road. He's like at every opening. He's meeting customers. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your philosophy of why you do that. Yeah, well, I, I like it. the hospitality industry by its very nature, it's a very hands-on, engaged, being involved, uh, being involved with the with the team members, knowing about their issues that have got going on, going to funerals, going to big life events and things that are going on, and and just being real and open and transparent, and honest and accessible uh, to people. Yes, and and that personality begins to get throughout the whole organization. Many businesses and food service, as they get older, the founders long gone. We forgot the founder's mentality. We get into a financial accounting, you know, kind of mind.
that's it. That's just the death of any business. Anytime the CFO takes over the food service business, sell your stock. If you're working for those employees, uh, companies, update your resume because the end is near when the accountants take over. I don't know if we have any accountants here, but um, <laughs> food service hospitality, you want to keep the accountants at bay. Stay closed on Sunday. Keep that fresh grease lemonade out there. Be personal. Stay engaged. I enjoy camping out with our customers. Uh, I camped out 150 nights with a sleeping bag and a tent for about for about. How does your wife feel about that? And I'm, and I'm still married. <laughs> he's, he's clearly still in training with his, <laughs> his marriage. Right? If I can make it to August, it'll be 50 years. Wow! Congratulations. That's yeah. amazing. That's beautiful. Did you know that only only six percent of the marriages? make it to 50 years, wow. Wow. only 6%. But if we can hang in there, tenacity, commitment, you know, get to the hard parts and own and on and on. It Same sets, principles that make it successful in business. Yeah. Make but it, but, but it right. sets up your children, mm. you know, to have success. At least you've done your part to model it. And part of that modeling is all so that you can get the next, second, third generation. Yes. Perhaps it can be. John Maxwell, who's one of our common friends, I'm sure, yes. says that success is all about succession. And family businesses, if, if the ownership is, is a, uh, not an option, I mean, if you're going to go from one generation to the next, their ownership responsibilities, that they don't have a choice on that. Now, if they want to work in the business, they have a choice about that. I love what Steve Harvey said recently. I've quoted it many times. He said, your career is what you're paid for, but your calling is what you're made for. That's right. And so our next generation kids you know, have to deal with, you know, is this a calling in your life? Do you feel that this is something that God is leading you to do? Because if you don't feel called to do this, then you just be a shareholder. but don't, don't try to run the business or to influence the business. But um, we have 12 in Generation 3. Uh, wow. They're married, most of them. That's they're funny. making babies, and there's 38 in Generation 4. So we're having to stay really forward-thinking on how we, the governance of a geometrically growing family that's also dealing with a geometrically growing business and keep you know, connected. I want to tell you, there's a lot of train wrecks that happen in family businesses. Only a third of the family-owned businesses make it to one generation at the next. Yes. So in my role now as chairman, I'm spending as much time dealing with the governance and the cohesiveness and the mentoring and the grooming of the third and fourth generation as I do in serving of the board of, of the restaurant business itself. What's been for you, I like to ask all entrepreneurs, what have been one or two of the most challenging times in the business and how'd you turn it around during those times? Mm -hmm. um, back in 1982 was a, one of the real traumatic experiences of our life as a business. 1982, we um, were dealing with inflation, but much more bigger inflation. Yeah. And my dad had borrowed $10 million to continue to expand the business and shopping malls were growing rapidly at the time in 1980. And we moved into a brand new corporate office building that had about 100,000 square feet of space in it. Uh, interest rates went up over 20%. We're talking about remember. interest rates now being five, six, seven, and getting all you know flustered because of that. But uh, inflation was, and, and it was a real financial crisis that we had going on. My dad was the only one that could put all the pieces together to understand, you know, what a dramatic crisis that we had that, that was going on. Uh, but we we persevered through that. We got through it. My dad had my brother and sister and I 
uh, in our home, he would, he would, this is a real great thing for everybody to hear. I just encourage all of you, you're all, many of your mom and dads, and you think, what does my six, seven, or eight-year-old got to do with our family business? But that's when you need to let them honor them by telling them what's going on with the business, mm. the good and the bad. Including the challenges times. Including the challenges and how it's you're real. wrestling. So they're prepared it's for real. the real they world. They see how you work through that. Yeah. Those issues in business, that transparency begins to build a business acumen and a business uh, vocabulary uh, in their mind. My dad would bring home sacks of cash. We'd had no credit cards. And we'd dump all that cash. And I was six or seven years old. I had to turn all the Lincoln faces the same way. And he'd strap all this money together, a whole week's worth of sales, load out on, on mom and dad's bed. And we'd, he'd, we'd count all that up and put straps around. He'd deposit on Monday morning. And little invoices come through, carbon copies. Carbon copies was these invoices that had these little <laughs> things here. And so I would, like I, put that, I put that on a clipboard. I thought it was so cool when my buddies came over, see these invoices, you know, on my, in my bedroom, you know, from bread company and so forth. But you, you be intentional about sharing and building a business acumen, yes. you know, without, by engaging our families. Yes. And then, then they have a model, not a model that's phony and fake, that everything goes perfectly all the time. Nothing's a straight line. I always say, yeah. there's no straight lines in yeah. nature. If there's a straight line, a human drew it, right? That's not how things grow in real life. That's beautiful. Um, I, one couple more questions. You have came up, your team, I don't know, somebody came up. I'd love to know the history of Eat More Chicken, where you got, <laughs> you've got cows telling everybody eat more chicken. That's crazy. Which is such a, that crazy? Very much like what you've done here with using yeah. the humor, right, to make yeah, that exactly, happen. Exactly. But it's been an incredible campaign. How did that come to be, and how has that affected your business? Well, it's pretty strange. I sometimes get letters from school teachers that talk to me about the disservice to literacy in America by having these cows that are misspelling, you know, things all the time. that's how cows spell it. So I, I, I have a nice little letter that I send back, and I said, well, you know, thank you for reminding of this. And I'm sure if these cows had been in your Sunday school or your, your classroom, they would have known how to do better. And then we send them copies of our ads, let the kids circle the misspelled words so we can make, you know, lemon, lemonade out of lemons and so forth. But it was developed by an agency in Dallas, Texas, the Richards Group. Uh, about 21 years ago, and uh, these cows still don't know how to spell, but it's very refreshing, uh, all these whimsical things that they come up with. So, Tony, I have to tell you, people ask me how I'm going to keep this up. I tell them, we're going to continue to milk it till the cows come home. So it's... <laughs> uh, That's awesome. <laughs> How did you, I understand you were an extraordinary wrestler in high school and college, and you're in the Hall of Fame of wrestling, from what I understand. Yeah, I still have uh, my cauliflower ear over here. On the my cauliflower ear. Well, you're, like, you're talking to the right lady right beside <laughs> you here, right? Um, how did that discipline affect you in business? Did it? Uh, did it shape you? Well, I'm so thankful for that. You know, I think I have, academics are very important, high school and college and so forth, but also the character developing things that we get through athletics. And... I was so fortunate. Outside my dad, in my teenage years, my wrestling coach, Johnny Stylins, had more of an influence on my life than anybody else. In order to get his praise, man, you had to do something really heroic. And I learned a lot of personal discipline about physically taking care of myself that I still do today. I was running earlier today before I came over here to visit, visit with you. Oh, wow. And so I, there are four areas in life that I think are essential. Mentally, staying a student. A teachable attitude, that quest, that curiosity. Emotionally, is to stay well balanced, a sense of hope and optimism. You know, the Bible, the Bible says, I've got great plans for you, you know, says the Lord. I know what I've made you to be. Yes. And that idea of hope and optimism. Thirdly, take care of yourself physically. You know, we, our, our emotions are very tied to, tied to how much sleep that we get and how many Krispy Kreme donuts that we eat. You know, all those <laughs> All those sorts of things. Yes. So, so, so be a champion athletically so that you can be a champion, you know, mentally and so forth. And then fourthly is we've got to take care of ourselves spiritually. We have all faiths that are represented in Chick-fil-A, and we're always respectful of all that. But we say, you know, there needs to be a sense of serenity. There needs to be a sense of humility. There needs to be a sense of inadequacy in our life. So that we know there's room to grow. Right. So we're humble. Yes. A sense of inadequacy. That seems strange to, th to acknowledge that as a leader. But when we're transparent and we acknowledge that, and people that are working with us, 
we say, well, you know, um, God promises us if we'll just acknowledge him in all our ways, mm. he'll direct our paths. Mm. So whether it's closed on Sunday or whatever way any of us can acknowledge our inadequacy and address the spiritual components of our life. Mm. How did that seventh day being free happen where you guys made that decision? I'm sure you've had tremendous number of people, fortunately you're not a public company, you're private, pushing on you to change that. But you've outdone everybody have seven days. You started at the top of our conversation with that. How, how much of a role does that play? Why is that important to you and to your employees? Yeah. Well, the genesis of it had nothing to do with any spirituality per se. Uh, my dad uh, grew up in a boarding house with his mom. And on Sunday... He had to wash dirty dishes, shuck corn, shell peas, and so forth in that little boarding house that he operated. And he hated to wash dirty dishes on Sunday. It was okay other days of the week, but Sunday afternoon when everybody's out having a good time and so forth. And he made a commitment that as a kid that if he ever got in the restaurant business, he was going to be closed on Sunday because he didn't like washing dirty dishes. And he figured nobody else enjoyed it doing it either. So when he opened up in 1946 on the 23rd of May, it was on a Tuesday. So he and his brother were there. That brother and another brother were later tragically killed two years later in an airplane accident. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they started looking at each other. We're going to open up on Sunday or not. Sunday was not a big trading day, you know, in, in the 1940s. And so they decided to be closed on that, that first Sunday, and we've been closed ever since. That wasn't a big deal until we got into the shopping malls, and even shop, regional shopping malls were closed on Sunday back in the 60s and 70s. But in the 80s, hmm. they began to have extended hours for holiday shopping, began to open up on Sunday. By then, we already had it in our lease that we were going to be closed on Sunday. Hmm. Uh, and we were challenged by a lot of developers that said, uh, you know, we really want you to open up on Sunday and on and on and on, but we made the commitment. But it's so remarkable that, as we mentioned earlier, our volumes that we do are just extraordinary. But there is a practical application in that when you're closed on Sunday, it makes your food taste better on Monday. You know, one, <laughs> people had to go an entire 24 hours without eating your food. So they had to go on Scarcity a of, hits them. A little bit of scarcity, yeah. Like children of Israel, you know. Wow, that's So wild. food tastes really good on Monday morning. Uh, but it gives our people a chance to rest. Uh, you know, the, 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 the grind of retail, the grind of 160 cars an hour coming through your drive, I want to tell you, there's a lot of grind and burn and energy that it takes to keep that going on. Typical operators got, you know, uh, over 120 employees per restaurant. Uh, at any one time, they got 25 that are, that are there. Somebody's not showing up. Somebody's got issues and all kind of things that are going on. So there's just a lot of, it requires a tremendous amount of energy to operate at peak performance, what our customers expect. And so to be able to relax on Sunday mm. and not have to worry about somebody not showing up, not having to worry about equipment breaking down, not have to worry about IT, cybersecurity issues going on, you know, you're just able just to rest. You can restore physically and spiritually, hopefully. Uh, restoring your marriage, and maybe have some fun with your kids. Yes. And seeing my dad just stretched out on a sofa on a Sunday afternoon watching a ball game, you know, just just rest. Man, he went to sleep really quick on Sunday afternoons. I bet, the way he worked. Yeah, but, but on Monday, he was ready to go. That's very cool. And, and I find it is a tremendous competitive advantage to shut it all down because, man, the energy and the restfulness that we can have on Monday improves Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that little incremental difference. But the time you, people ask me, how much money does it cost y'all to be closed on Sunday? I said, man, if you really knew, the incremental service that we get and the sales that we get on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, more than makes up, mm -hmm. dramatically more than makes up the fact that we're closed on Sunday. And our competition hadn't figured that out, but I'm telling you, that's the truth. That's, that's awesome. very measurable. That's of brilliant. Our Make, give it a hand. That's absolutely brilliant. Beautiful and brilliant, both. You know, really, really I, I'm great. not that smart now. You say it's brilliant. <laughs> you know, that was my dad's decision, but I certainly brought into it, and so has my uh, third generation as well. My brother and sister and I signed a covenant before our mom and dad passed away mm. that the rest of our lives, we were going to continue to be closed on Sunday because we didn't want them to be any question about that That's going beautiful. forward. I read that the red sh polo shirts that they wear are made out of plastic bottles. 
Is that true? Tell us about that. That is. So we do a lot. We're, we're have, 17 all of us plastic have to be, bottles to make one yeah. shirt or something like that? All of us have to be very environmentally conscious. Yes. Um, and it's about nutrition. It's about waste removal. It's about um, uh, env- uh, responsible sources of supply, you know, coming up through the, yes. the whole deal. And, uh, yes, I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of solar-powered restaurants now. Uh, I say a lot. We've got three that are open up now in California. We're going to do more about that. Wow. But I think it's part of just being a responsible citizen of the community yes. uh, and including apparel as well where we can recycle. We also collect a lot of foam cups and own and own. So it's a big responsibility. How many uh, bottles are actually saved a year just by... That's a good question. I don't know that stat. That's a good one. I know that we're juicing an awful lot of lemons out in California. Because I read it was millions and millions of bottles because I think it's like, isn't it like 17 or 19 bottles makes one shirt? You, you ain't know more about that than I do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What your family has done is extraordinary. It's not only giving people healthier food and made it faster and quicker, but it's spread kindness, it's spread love, it's spread values that really are invaluable. And I think a company, uh, you know, why do you form a company? A lot of people form it for their own financial independence, which is beautiful, but I think it's also a chance to engender values. You both have done that. And I think that's what gives the drive that keeps a generation or two to continue to go there because it was just the economics. It gets to a point, as you well know, where the numbers don't really affect you anymore personally. It's really what, you know, where is the meaning? And you brought meaning to your family through your service, through these restaurants, and to so many of your employees. And that's why you're so beloved, you know, eight years in a row, the favorite restaurant. We all need to live purpose-driven lives. And I would just close by saying that our corporate purpose uh, is this, is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that's entrusted to us mm-hmm. and have a positive impact on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. That's we cool. should all desire to live purpose-driven lives and it makes all the difference in the world you're amazing thank you you and your family thank you for all you've done let's hear it for dan